Hello and welcome. Thank you to everyone joining us online and here in person at the two Mississippi museums. I'm Ariana Rivera Lee, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at Zocalo Public Square, an Arizona State University media enterprise. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to each other. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writings and present conversations like this one. You can find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org, on po podcast platforms, and YouTube. So please subscribe for our latest programs. We were founded in 2003, and we are now celebrating our 20th year. We are based in Los Angeles. We are based in Los Angeles, and we are very excited to be here in Jackson, Mississippi. Tonight, we present the second program in our two-year event and editorial series, How Should Societies Remember Their Sins, supported by the Mellon Foundation. Through September of this year, four public conversations and an array of, of original works published on our website will address this question, exploring how societies around the world collectively remember their transgressions and make attempts at repair and how we might imagine new paths forward. We continue the series this evening by asking, what kind of monuments do we deserve? I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, William Sturkey. William is a historian at the University of North Carolina who specializes in the history of race in the American South. He is the author of Hattiesburg, an American city in black and white, winner of the 2020 Zocalo Book Prize. He is our guide not only for this conversation, but for the other programs in our series as well. Over to you, William. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is William Sturkey, and I'm pleased to introduce our guests for tonight's conversation. To my immediate left is Daphne Chamberlain, a native of Columbus, Mississippi. And Daphne Chamberlain serves as Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Social Justice. And she is also an Associate Professor of History at her alma mater, the historic Tougaloo College. Before, 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 before returning to Tougaloo as a faculty member in 2013, Chamberlain was the founding director of the COFO Civil Rights Education Center at Jackson State University. And she has also served as a scholar consultant for numerous local, state, and national civil rights projects. Her scholarship focuses on children's activism in the 1960s civil rights movement. Richard A. Liu, to her left, grew up in a biracial family that was spiritually and intellectually guided by parents who were both anti-colonialist and culturally affirming. His artwork has been cited in over 40 scholarly books and on the cover of five different books. The most recent of which, Chicano Art, a Critical Anthology, was included by Art News in the top 100 art books of the decade. Lou served for a total of 29 years as department chair at three institutions of higher education, and he continues to exhibit while teaching in the Department of Art at the University of Memphis. Of Memphis. Patrick Weems, also a Mississippi native just up the road in Ridgeland, is the co-founder of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. He has dedicated his career to ensuring that the tragic story of Emmett Till is not only remembered, but also serves as a catalyst for positive change in the state and beyond. He holds a master's degree from the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi, and is a former Monument Lab Fellow and W.K. Kellogg Fellow. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight with us. So how we'll proceed is this. As moderator, I will lead with some questions for our esteemed panelists, and then we'll dive into some questions from our audience toward the end of our discussion. If you're watching online, you can submit questions in the live chat on, on YouTube. With that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to remind our panelists that you have to turn your mics on, please and hold them close to your mouth. 
Um, I'd like to start by getting us all on equal footing, so to speak. So for each of you, could you talk about what exactly are monuments and what do they mean in our society today? Good evening, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here on panel. Um, monuments for me, of course, um, I was joking earlier that I love alliteration. So I have a couple of words when I think of monuments across the state of Mississippi, but a number of monuments that I've visited across the American South in particular. Um, one of those words is remembrance, reflection, reconciliation, and last but not least, rededication in some instances. So for me, um, in terms of defining monuments, they aren't necessarily relegated to a physical structure because I even think of people being monumental because of the work that they've done in communities, especially with my work around the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. But um, yeah, that, that's it for me, William, um, is, is when I think about monuments, those are the words that come to mind to, uh, for me, but it's not just the physical structures or statues that stand, but there are also people who uh, continue to serve as monuments because of the work that they've done and the legacy that they've left. Richard? Yes, um, also thank you so much for in, inviting me to be on this August panel. Uh, monuments to, to me has, um, is uh, a way where uh, a region or a country can create its, uh, its own image, sort of uh, like nation building, uh, an, ex an expression of power, and also to elicit fear and to make sure that, and, uh, and also it's a teaching uh, artifact uh, to how to behave, uh, how to keep people in line, and, uh, and, uh, and not to transgress against those in authority and power. Um, and I, I would completely agree with Daphne that, that I see people as monuments as well. And also with technology, you know, I think of uh, video as being monu monuments. I think about uh, the beating of Rodney King, uh, that video being shown over and over and over and over becomes monumental. Or the, the video documentation of January 6th, uh, where they show it over and over and over, and these expressions of power. And so they become monumental in my mind. And also, uh, whoever can control these monuments can control meaning, which for me is the most critical aspect of monument making and monument retention or destruction. All right. <laughs> I've got a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, I, I, th I think everything you said is exactly right. Uh, would, would agree with that. Um, for me, I think about it in terms of, of, of uh, peace building studies um, and think there's a term call, called moral imagination. Um, this idea of thinking about how do we use arts and storytelling, monuments even, uh, to process past pains? Um, how do you use it? In particular, they, they think about it with countries that have gone through civil war, or genocide, that the first thing they need is not new infrastructure or schools. Um, they, need, they need the arts. They need the storytelling. They need the culture to heal from whatever has taken place. Uh, and that, that those monuments, those art can also lead towards how a society is going to rebuild. Um, and so while it can be this control, I think about the Dollars Confederacy, I think about those type of statues, I also think that they can be used for um, reimagining uh, past wounds and, and creating a narrative for moving forward. So is there much of a difference between monuments and memorials or, or even cemeteries? What are, what are the functional differences between monuments and cemeteries or m memorials? I'll just throw that out for, there for anyone. So, uh, I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind is, is that we're, we're all trying to honor our dead. Um, and, and how do you do that? Um, and I, I think one of the opportunities is, is, is can we create a, a space so that we can honor all dead? Um, um, hopefully um, in, in a respectful way, right? And in a, um, to, to promote a multicultural democracy, right? That we're not lifting one person's dead over another. Um, but we're, we're creating that space. So um, 
I don't know about the differences in monuments and memorials and graveyards, but I think there's a, a commonality in how we are honoring the people that came before us. And just to add to what Patrick has stated, um, I think with, with regard to honoring those who have died, it, we're also talking about inspiring those who continue to live and, and continue those narratives of, of family members, of, of those who have made these, um, made these significant sacrifices across the hist historical uh, spectrum. So that's, that's what I see. And I'm kind of like you, Patrick, I don't understand, you know, really know the difference between the two, but that's the way in which I look at it because of my own family cemetery, mm -hmm. is thinking about, you know, all of these are the people who laid the groundwork before me, and these are the people who continue to inspire me, and of course, those are the shoulders that I stand on, and will be able to have my children stand on those shoulders as well. Let me rephrase the question for the artist. <laughs> One th that I want to point out is often in cemeteries and memorials, you look down to honor the people who are, who are, who are deceased. But in monuments, so often your eye goes up. So to, to an artist, you know, based, considering that fact, how would you answer the question? Well, I was going to say that the, the, the difference, I mean, in my, in, my, in my own brain is like a, the, the difference between a private and public imaginary. And, uh, or the difference between a story and a narrative, you know, where public monuments are part of a larger narrative, right? And the cemetery, those are individual stories. Those are people that we lo know and love uh, rather than uh, public figures that have participated in these larger events that have actually affected our lives. And um, so that's the way I, I see the difference between, between those two, uh, private and public. Um, intimate and um, and larger larger than life you know heroic for one group of people and um, and non non heroic for others so I want to ask about some of the harder things about monuments and, and why they're so hard I want to talk about feelings specifically everyone in this room everyone watching us knows that this is an emotional and very politically charged conversation why is that what, I mean, can we really sort of tease out why is this so emotional? Oftentimes people are arguing over monuments that aren't actually connected to their own individual families, yet it's just as emotional as if it was your own, you know, grandfather or ancestor or whatever. You know, um, if you want to talk about emotions or politics, whatever, but why are the stakes so high? There are some single issue voters and monument is their single issue that they, that they vote on. So why are they so important in our society? Why is it so charged, um, especially in recent years? I'll start. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I guess I'll start with this. Is, is There's a lot of anxiety around truth telling. Um, and, and I think about, and I see Mr. Spears in the, the audience this evening, but I think about a panel that happened several years ago and talking about historical amnesia mm -hmm. and how if, um, you know, it, it's, it's important for us to tell the story and, and it, of course, those stories vary from person to person. But when we talk about feelings getting involved, and of course, depending on what those monuments mean to you personally or uh, politically, that is where, of course, you have, have this polarizing issue that, that rises or bubbles to the top and it begins to fester. And then it manifests itself in such a way that we begin to see the actions of people um, in places like January 6th. So, um, for me, um, when we think about monuments and, and the role in which they play day to day and you know how people are internalizing their meaning, it's, it's, it's a very difficult conversation to have, but it's a real conversation to be had simply because of the fact that there is so much controversy around the conversation. Mm -hmm. In 2009, I did a performance, I wrote and directed a performance at, it was called then, uh, Nathan Bedford Forest Park in Memphis, Tennessee. And, um, and after the performance, we had a panel discussion similar to this um, at the, um, the Powerhouse Gallery, now is defunct. And, uh, and some of the sympathizers of the Confederate monuments were there as part of the discussion. And this woman stood up and said that she had a personal relationship to General Forrest, she would say. 
that General Forrest helped her family or her ancestors get over uh, a difficult time in their lives. And so she felt a, a very personal connection to uh, General Forrest. But at the same time, for uh, people that have been marginalized and people of color, that symbol is a negation, right? Uh, and is a, and is, it's a negation of who, we, of who we are and what we strive to be. And so in that same room, those two opposing viewpoints uh, were created an incredible dynamic in regards to the conversation of how can one exist, right, at the, in the same space as the contrary notion. So it's a very, I mean, and I think, and I don't mean to speak on her behalf, but her worldview was wrapped. And if that worldview was removed, then how could she situate herself in regards to how she relates to everyday life? And the same for me. My worldview exists in, con in contrast and in opposition to what Nathan Bedford stood for. So its existence is a threat to me. I have to admit, I've, I've read a lot about Nathan Bedford Forrest. I've never heard about him as a friendly neighbor or <laughs> a helping hand. So that's a new one, but thank you. Depends on the neighbor. Sure. <laughs> um, really good questions. Um, these, are, these are really thought provoking. Um, I, it's for, for me, I, I'm, I'm thinking through that, that, that we don't argue well. Um, we don't uh, debate well. Uh, I, I, the, the Alluvial Collective, which is based here in Jackson, uses something called the welcome table, a way to engage in conversation around difficult subjects. I think that is uh, a really good first step. Um, but we're also here in the two museums, the Civil Rights History Museum of Mississippi, uh, where we've got um, our traveling exhibit from the Emmett Till Interpretive Center upstairs, and we put up a historical sign uh, marker, um, the third one, uh, to where Emmett Till, a 14-year-old child, his body came out of the Tallahatchie River. Um, and someone thought that the way to debate that whether that memorial should be there was to shoot it up. Um, and the first one was put up in 2008 and was thrown in the Tallahatchie River. The second was shot so many times that you could not read the writing on it. And then the third one was shot, and then some students from my alma mater, University of Mississippi, stood in front of it um, with guns. And so I think it, on one side, I'm like, oh, we just need to argue better. <laughs> you know. And then the other side, there, there are people with guns uh, using that as their way to communicate. And so um, I would hope we would lean into our better angels and we figure out a way to communicate um, with words. Uh, but it is, uh, it is definitely, I mean, even for a 14-year-old child, right? And you feel like, yeah. you feel so threatened by that that you have to destroy a sign. Um, we got to do a lot better. Uh, that's for sure. You know, that, that brings me to my next question, which is very much related. But so from the top down, there's a lot of silences related to conversations like this, even even this panel, this the, the past few days in Mississippi, I get the feeling that there are some people that don't want panels like this to necessarily happen. And that's not unique to this state, but that's across the United States. And then of course there are also different laws um, that are banning divisive concepts, I think is the most common phrasing. But it's an odd thing because the monuments are everywhere. They're all around us. The streets and the, and the statues and the buildings, they're everywhere. You can barely turn around. There are counties named after people like Nathaniel Bedford Forrest. But then at the same time, despite their omnipresence, we're not allowed to talk about them in some cases. If you speak about them and you want to work for the state or you want to run for politics, it could end your career. So I have two questions. First, what do you make of that observation? And then second is, what sort of a message does that send to children? What sort of a message does that send if we're thinking future oriented about what monuments do we deserve? I mean, how do we reconcile the work that needs to be done based on that reality? I, 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 well, I'll jump in. Um, I, 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 yeah, silence has is, 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 is almost been the, um, I grew, so I grew up in Mississippi, um, um, Jackson Metro, 
Richland was said, that's close enough where I was born. Um, and, you know, we, I grew up in kind of a post-racial lens, right? And, and we didn't talk about race uh, or, you know, Confederate statues or anything like that because we, we, we had moved past it and we, we weren't going to talk about it. Um, and so, yeah, it feels like we're entering a new phase. I mean, I, I, for sure, the work that we, we do in the Mississippi Delta to honor Emmett Till, there was a 50-year silence where nobody publicly mentioned Emmett Till for 50 years. Uh, and it wasn't until um, a, a highway uh, memorial sign was put up um, in around 2005, uh, and immediately someone wrote KKK on it. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it feels like different ways of silencing. Um, I think at one point there was just so much power and control that um, you know no alternative story could be told. Um, and and as they as we as as we're flexing our muscles and, and telling more inclusive stories, um, they they're, they're seems to be finding new ways to silence. Um, uh, but I think we're finding new ways to communicate too. I mean, we built a smartphone app after our signs got shot up, and you know there's. We've, we've responded with a traveling exhibit. So I think there's uh, authoritarianism and silencing is very difficult. And I think we've got to continue to find ways um, to, to spread our messages. I, um, I teach in the University of Memphis in, in Tennessee, and they have recently passed the divisive concept laws two years ago. And it created a chilling effect on our campus. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, I was carefully listening to what Patrick had to say in regards to uh, we need to debate better or it's you know or talk better. But if these laws continue, we won't have the same facts. Uh, those, as bell hooks would say, th that knowledge would be subjugated. And so, how can we debate better if we're not going to have the same facts? Um, since the Reagan era, they have demonized education and educators. And so now they've created, they, ha they have created, I hate to say this, but into, they have now tr uh, created to a, a, a fine art. Uh, they have devised these things to codify silence, right? Not just at the K through 12 level, but also at the university and college level. And if you do not abide by the silence, you'll be silenced uh, economically. And so there is a large carrot and stick component uh, to the divisive laws. And now you have to also report what you're doing to uh, balance the, the diversity, the intellectual diversity on the campus as well. So there's a, um, it is getting very, it's past scary um, uh, in regards to the, the legislation that is, uh, uh, has occurred and will, in, is coming down, down the pike. So I, I have the great privilege of not having only graduated from Historic Tugu College, I have the opportunity to also teach there and serve as an administrator. So, of course, we're, we're not restricted by um, some of what you're faced with, Richard. But um, Patrick has heard me say this before, is until the lion learns to write his own story, the hunter will be the one who was glorified. So it's really important for us to make sure um, in spaces however we can, we can better debate um, the conversation around um, the history and how it should be taught, taught. And you know, it's not about teaching these students what to think, but it's to teach them how to think and expanding their minds and intellectual capacity in such a way that um, they go out and they understand that there are systems in place that are oppressing marginalized groups of people. But it's important that we make sure that these students understand the power of the pen on paper and, and articulating these stories and being inclusive and not silencing um, the histories of those of us sitting here on this stage, those of us sitting in this audience, and even spaces uh, that re reflect this history here in um, the two Mississippi museums. But of course, that, that has been the one thing that has inspired me most because as a student at Tougaloo College, I was pushed to
to think and I was pushed to ask questions of those sources that, um, that I was reading, which is the reason I sit in the position that I'm in now and doing the research that I do. And that goes to your, your final part of your question, William, around you know how does this impact young people? As long as you have people who are sitting on the stage like us and, and doing the work that we're doing, we can really fight against all of these structures that are in place that keep this information from young people, expose these young people to the history, and make sure that it is not lost. And that, that's how you get at that, um, William. And I think that's a really, really important part. Everybody doesn't get the experience that I had uh, as a youngster or as, as a Tougaloo student, but that's our responsibility. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Let's start dreaming. Um, <laughs> What would our, so our, our prompt here, what monuments do we deserve? What would our world look like? Or what would our region or our country or what would Mississippi look like if we had monuments that we don't have to protect with removal laws? If we had monuments that we don't have to say, well, we can't talk about the conflicts that those monuments came from. If we had monuments that were built into the curriculum, if we had monuments that every student wanted to go to, um, what would that look like is sort of the, the way that I want to shift our conversation next. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Richard to start because Richard, you once said that one thing that monuments could do or that they should do is empower children with a way to defend themselves. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by children being able to defend themselves through public monuments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I shared that story with you when, when, um, when I was growing up in the San Diego, Tijuana er area. Um, you know, my, my mom only had a second grade education and, and my father uh, finished high school, went to a little bit of college. And, um, and my family from, from Mexico would, would, you know, come and visit. And they would a ask me and encourage me, uh, are you going to college? And I, I would say yes. And they would always say, que bueno, para defenderte, good, to defend yourself. So education in our, in our arena, our familial arena, was not how do you get a good job, uh, how to advance yourself, et cetera. It's how to protect yourself and your loved ones from those that are trying to exploit you. And that stuck with me, that this is how, this is the purpose, this is one of the purposes of education of a formal education is not only to find joy, right, in knowledge and find purpose in knowledge creation, but also to, to use it to, as a talisman to protect yourself and your loved ones against those that are interested in doing you harm. And I don't, uh, hopefully I'm not coming off as like the negative one on stage because <laughs> I am filled with hope. But I wanted to give the background to that. And Daphne said something very important at the very beginning. You know, and I was thinking about your question, William, and what, what, what would be my greatest wish? It is to fully enfranchise or re-enfranchise the human monuments that walk amongst us and to fully resource the human monuments that walk amongst us so they can find their full potential in this, in this, in this country. And um, so that, for me, would be the investment that would be critical. And beyond that, I, I don't have the experience to like say what it would look, what it would it look like without your community being subjugated. I don't know what that looks like. And maybe uh, future generations with that enfranchisement, with those resources, can dream what a society could look like that's not subjugated and does not part uh, participate and perpetuate systems of domination. Daphne and Patrick, what kind of monuments do we deserve? I share this story quite often in thinking about, um, as a fifth or sixth grader, I remember returning to Mississippi and um, reading the Jet Magazine. 
and seeing one of the most gruesome images any child that age could see, and that was an image of Emmett Till. And in that moment, I saw myself in that story. Um, despite how many years separated his murder and um, the life I was living at that time, he was black like me, he was close in age with me, and of course, his murder happened here in the state of Mississippi. And I think one of the things that we really need to think about as we think about future generations is how can we allow our young people to see themselves in the narrative in a positive way? Because at that particular point in my life, that, that was a negative image of Mississippi. And that's all I could think about. And I was begging my parents, can we please move mm. back to where we came from? But of course, I understood that that was a part of the story of this state, this state's rich history. But of course, that there were young people who were um, motivated. And also, that gave momentum or life to a civil rights movement that was led by young people here in this state of Mississippi. And I think that that's really important for young people to see themselves be empowered by the power and agency that those young people demonstrated during the 1950s and 60s. And you know that when we think about monuments, it is it lies in the folks who led these movements and allowed their voices to be amplified, and the, the actions that they made and the sacrifices made and be respected and also well received by younger generations. Um, my my highest hope is I mean I, I think we have especially here in Mississippi it, it feels like we're moving from crisis to crisis and um, you know it it it, it feels like that's, you know, we're trying to prevent something bad from happening. Um, I hope we can get to a space, and, and, and again, like, I, 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 there's, there's so many crises, but, but, but how do we, um, my highest hope is that we could, we, we could have a democratic process where we're able to show up, we're able to engage, we're able to trust that the actual leaders would listen after decision makings have been made on a, uh, uh, on a community level, um, and then we would find out that we have a lot in common. Um, you know, as Governor Winter would say, we all want a good, we all want a good job, we all want a safe neighborhood, we all want a car in our, our driveway. Um, you know, we have these things that, um, and, and then how do you represent those values into monuments, into memorials? Um, how do you create that that safety, that courage? Yeah. I want to come back to you, Patrick, to ask about something that um, there's, there is a, a video where you were interviewed telling this incredible story. And the thing that I took away from that video was this line that you said. And it was, and I quote, we think it's really important if we're going to listen to stories that we listen to everybody's story. And it made me think of so many of our debates over Confederate monuments today, right, focus on the sins of the Confederacy and the sins of the antebellum South and the sins of slavery. Right? But then, of course, many of the arguments in favor of keeping Confederate monuments sort of treat those monuments as memorials themselves. You know, the poor everyday soldier who was sort of dragged off to war, and of course, many of those people you know, did not have prosperous lives. They didn't own packs of you know, enslaved people and these huge houses and things like that. And I just wonder, you know, in light of the tone of our conversations, how do we then also make space for, for that claim as well? I don't. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I mean, I, I mean, I mean specifically the the. I don't, I don't know the. Uh, that 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 person. There was a the, the, that video. Can I explain the video? I think sure, like, please. So yes. This there's a video or uh, or a real life event um, where we 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 finally put up a historical marker in Sumner, Mississippi, where the trial of J. W. Milam and Roy Bryant, two of uh, the murderers, uh, that 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 lynched and murdered and tortured in Emmett Till, uh, were tried and, and, and freed. Uh, and finally, there was 53, 52 years later, there was a historical marker put up. Uh, and this community member came out um, and was, was very frustrated, was very angry that someone had um, put this up. And he, he wanted to, he came into the courtroom and he wanted to know who was behind this. And so one of the commissioners of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission um, came out and, and said, she said that we did, well, the community did. And so he was already thrown off balance because he assumed that somebody from the state or from the federal government had put this in his, his community. 
Um, and then he started the rant, well, why are, we, why are we talking about this? This is long and gone. We shouldn't be talking about this. Mind you, 30 yards across from it, there's a Confederate statue. Um, but, but why are we talking about this? Um, this is long and gone. Um, and she, she just gave him space to rant, um, which, is, which is probably if he was a black man, he probably not would have had that space possibly, right? Um, but but, but he, she dignified him with, with space, um, listened to his story, uh, and finally, after he felt listened to, uh, he was in a receptive mode. And so she said, how old is your son? And I think she already knew, but he said, I'm not sure. I think he's about to turn 14. And she said, well, that's how old Emmett was. And we're not trying to force anything on anybody. We're not trying to change anybody's way of life. But we're trying to tell this story so it never happens to anybody else's 14-year-old. Um, and so that's when he went back to his house. He came to her house later and offered to put a uh, garment over the, the marker the day, uh, day that the, our community was apologizing to the Till family for what took place in our community um, and, you know, offered that as his, his way. So he had a Damascus change overnight, you know, within, you know, three hours. Um, that's not always possible, but I think that is a high hope. And I, and I do, I mean, I, I do, I believe in humanity. I still believe um, that we have better angels. Um, and I, and I think sometimes it, that was a white person talking to a white person. I think that sometimes is what we need. Um, um, so yeah, does that answer your question? It's it a good story yeah. regardless. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I have time for just, just one last question for each of you, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience here. But I, I just wanna ask, is there anyone or any group of people in particular, or any type of monument even, especially beyond a statue, that you think um, we could incorporate as we build more monuments in the future? I grew up in Columbus, Mississippi. And um, I shared with William earlier this week that I just done, I had some of my earliest history lessons just driving around the community. And um, big pilgrimage town. Every April, you would have the pilgrimage. And I used to always be in awe of the antebellum homes. So of course, it was odd for people to hear me say at the University of Mississippi that I wanted to do uh, Civil War and Reconstruction history and completely went in a different direction with civil rights history. But um, I also shared with William in that conversation that I think of those homes as monuments, but not to the um, affluence of those who live there, but really to, to lift up the stories and the, the unheard voices of those who built those homes, and that's those enslaved people. So um, that's, that's my answer, is when I think about monuments just in my childhood, and even thinking outside of the box on who those monuments represent or reflect their story. It's those untold stories or those uh, voices that have been silenced that do need to be amplified and we need to pay attention to there are always two sides of the story. I'd like to lift up what Patrick had to say a moment ago and part of it is how do we decenter the narrative, right, and localize it and, uh, and to provide opportunities where we can listen to each other and remind each other that, that we're neighbors and, that, uh, and not enemies and that we have a commonality and that commonality is our humanity. And how do we lift, how do we lift that up? How do we find opportunities? How do we seize upon opportunities to continue to do that and then build process a collaborative process where we can amplify each other's voices, right? Block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, because if we listen to what is, if we listen to the, cent the narrative broadcast by the centers of power, we're never gonna be able to talk to each other. You know, Richard, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what you said just one step further. Um, perhaps we need monuments that aren't just the soldiers and to violent acts, but, but to educators and to builders and to people that you know, raised families. Patrick? Uh, I was gonna say like a really big horse with a guy on top of it, but I guess that was not. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 um, 
Yeah, I, I really like the localized piece of this, right? That that once you get to the local, um, that's where the real conversation happens. And um, and I do think there is the possibility that that we are stars in the night and that we can help guide each other. That if Sumner, Mississippi can take responsibility and change its own narrative, that we can light up for Webb, Mississippi, or for Memphis, or wherever, and that we can we can gain strength off of each other. So. Um, I, I think that is, but I, but I, I definitely think that that local piece is where we can hear each other. Okay, let's take some questions. Huh? If anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to stand over here to the right. But our first question comes from our YouTube live chat. Uh, this is a general question for the panelists. How often, we often turn to the arts to help us confront fraught histories. What are some other modes of political imagination that you can think of? Yes, uh, we often turn to the arts to help us confront fraught histories. What are some other modes of political imagination that you can think of? I think Patrick mentioned the uh, welcome table earlier. Just having meaningful, transparent, honest conversations, that, that is a perfect platform, not always the, the easiest platform to be able to open up in conversation, but I think that, that that's how you begin to remember, reflect, and reconcile. Um, <clears throat> to piggyback, um, we're, you know, we're a society that we're look, constantly looking at our phone and, um, and isolating ourselves, and, um, and we used to be a society of uh, entertainment centers, right, where instead of sitting on our porches uh, conviviendo, with, uh, living with our neighbors, we like look and put something in our VCR or a DVD player, but actually to return to uh, being porch people and having, you know, having conversations with your neighbors, right? And maybe even having monthly block parties where people can come up, have food, share food, tell stories, laugh, celebrate each other. And, um, that's doesn't take much effort. I, I, they answered it. Our, our, <laughs> plus, I, I do. I really do think art is 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 a, a pivotal way. Uh, I think uh, uh, welcome table like conversations uh, are, are are key. Community is key. Trust is key. Um, but but I, I think we underemphasize the power of art and storytelling and literature, and we've got to remember that those are those are sacred. They're they're what cultures have relied on for generations, um, and and that they are power. Our, our our stories are our power. Our next questions come from uh, an in-person audience member. Hi, um, my name is Cynthia Groya, and first of all, I'm very honored to be um, in this setting. Um, this is a, an amazing panel. Patrick, you mentioned earlier that you grew up in a post-racial um, society, household, or whatever, and so you didn't talk about it growing up. And I wish you could just be elaborate on that a little bit. I'm an elementary school teacher. I teach art, and I'm teaching about Mississippi history and culture through the arts. I'd be fired if I were in Florida right now. but. I find that the kids don't talk about this. They have not talked about this, and that's a problem. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, I mean, I grew, I grew up in, in Mississippi. I grew up uh, going to a school not from here, far from here. And, and I, I'm, I mean, I'm just, I, you know, one of my stories is, is, is having a racial incident happen on, on campus as a high school student. And then um, someone used the N-word to a friend of mine. I was in the middle of, uh, of this kind of skirmish, and the N-word was used. Um, other epithets were used against the Jewish students. And then we just didn't talk about it. You know, we got punished. Uh, and then, but we never really went to the root of why did when 
a fight began and people went to their worst punch, verbal punch, and they went to those words. Um, and we didn't deconstruct that. We didn't use that as a learning tool or learning moment. Um, we just had to wash tables. And, and um, you know, was, they were really clean afterwards. But uh, I, 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 feel, I feel like, uh, you know, I've got a two and a half year old. I hope that I am, um, you know, I hope he gets as m a lot of that from home. I hope he gets from school. I hope he gets him from his church that we are not in a post-racial society, that we, and thank God we're not. Right, um, and so um, if you have ideas, share them with me. I, I, I think it's we are in a learning. I, I don't have the answers, but I, I know what what I was, what I what happened to me was not the answer. Yeah. Could, could you just then say what it was that turned you on or made you aware that you needed to start talking about it? Uh, what made me aware was running away from Mississippi because the guy thought it was broken; it would never change. Uh, and that's why I think memorials are important, that we realize they can change. Um, and we realize societies and communities can change. But I learned that from learning from the Till generation, learning about the civil rights movement, learning those stories about how young people did make change in Mississippi, uh, and then giving me hope to actually stay here and make part of that change. Thank you very much. Yeah. Our next question. Hello, my name is Michael Wu. I'm a Zocalo board member from Los Angeles visiting Jackson for the first time. Thank you to the moderator and the panel for a scintillating conversation. My question to each of the panelists is, if you could look 10 years into the future, could you propose a new monument in Mississippi that does not currently exist? And what message would you want that monument to tell a visitor? Can I actually jump? I'm going to give you guys a second, because to me, there's an easy answer for that. Um, in 1860, the number of enslaved people outnumbered the number of white people in this state by over 80,000. And everywhere you look, there's Confederate monuments. There's virtually nothing that recognizes their existence. And it would be something that was big and important, and it said that these people lived here and that they mattered. Love it. History is, is complex and, and complicated all at the same time. Um, ten years forward, I would say perhaps a monument that is a labyrinth of sorts that um, captures the good, the bad, and the ugly. But of course, it's inclusive, and it includes all of those voices that make up this rich history that um, in the state where many of us were born, raised, and loved. Uh, besides William's brilliant idea, <laughs> um, a statewide academy where, where students, high school students can come and learn strategies of resistance, whether it's storytelling, art making, journalism, uh, investigative reporting, research, history, the language arts, etc., but all based around resistance. Williams was amazing um, and needed. I think it takes the, the best of Mississippi to talk about the worst of Mississippi, right? That's what KSA Lehman told me one time, and I stick to that. Um, I, I also think that there's space for black joy. I think there's space for the Chinese American experience in the Delta. I think there's so many Mississippis. There needs to be a, a memorial, a monument for all. Like, we need more stories, not less stories. Let's flood our imagination with stories. Let's do a, uh, you know, one for our writers, the amazing writers from Mississippi, the amazing e educators from Mississippi. Like, just pour it on. Uh, and then a couple of football ones would be great. <laughs> <laughs> our next cu question comes from? Uh, Professor David Yates from Millsaps College. Um, so um, when I think about the, the grand monumental tradition, right, the sort of big statue, the massive stonework and all this, and you think about it in its sort of its historical context, it's almost always wrapped up in power and systems of domination. You look at societies like Greece or Rome, those were powerful people building statues to say a very specific kind of message, almost always wrapped up in oppression. Um, 
when we think about new monuments or monuments we deserve, should we be thinking outside of that tradition? Maybe in a not post-memory world, of course, but post-grand monument tradition. You know, I'm thinking about you were mentioning the the houses, right? Found monuments that are multivalent by definition and not built to transmit an actual specific message. That's for everyone. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. So I, 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 I yes, obviously, right? I mean, we, we, the, the, and I, I mean, I hope everyone know. I was joking when I said a bigger horse and a bigger man. Um, um, I, I don't want to go to a space where, where you're like, what is it, right? Like, I, I, I hope that they emote some type of meaning. Um, um, but I think that that that, you know, that meaning is love. That meaning is community. That mean, I mean, and how do you show that, right? How do you express that? Maybe it is gathering spaces where, where communities who ordinarily would not have come to the courthouse square because they felt that was not their space, that it becomes a gathering space, that people feel comfortable there, they see themselves in that place. Um, so I think placemaking could be a part of this. Um, but I, I, I hope that, again, we just flood the imagination with those possibilities. I, I I really, I really like what Patrick had to say, it, but in regards to like space making, but where there's ritual, right? And the and the ritual is the coming together of different communities uh, to uh, reconnect, to to um, reaffirm the 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 how they bind, how they're bound to each other, and um, and I think. Those are, I think, you know, and they could be very instructive, you know. You do, you know, it's like step by step, like uh, uh, like a game. You do this, you know. It could be like walls that have text and it says, okay, now do this. Hold each other's hands or, or, or you know, go touch, a, go hold, a, embrace a stranger, et cetera. But, um, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. But the idea of not just objects, but how does that, how do those objects activate the space where it elicits an action by all of us, right? An action that uh, recreates community. Oh, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are short on time, but our last question comes from our YouTube live chat. What are the most compelling monuments you're seeing young people create? How will they shape purpose and or impact a monument change as our younger generations grow up? So I'll give a, a, a shout out to the Emmett Till Academy in Sunflower County. Um, Gloria Dickerson, who is a board supervisor there, her family helped integrate the schools and drew, uh, she unseated um, a, a man who was a distant cousin uh, of the murderers of Emmett Till. She beat him twice uh, as a black woman. Um, but she started uh, the Emmett Till Academy to help young people, because Emmett Till was murdered in, Tal I mean, Sunflower County, almost said Tallahatchie County, in Sunflower County. And that story has gone really unrecognized. And, and um, those, those group of young people have created a civil rights tour of the Mississippi Delta. Um, they're thinking through um, what a marker might look like uh, in their community in Drew, Mississippi. So it's unfinished, um, but I, I, I just want to give them a shout out as a, as a group of young people that are thinking through this type of work. The Tougaloo Nine, um, Joyce Ladner, Hollis Watkins, Nicolia Liddell, MacArthur Cotton, and I'm thinking about students who were at Tougaloo during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. But I'm also thinking about students who are currently enrolled at the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School, who just recently got a documentary, a short documentary, on Tougaloo's role in the Civil Rights Movement accepted to National History Day. And they were also uh, led by M Mississippi's uh, Educator of the Year, Alexandria Drake. So when I think about 
these monuments that young people are committed to putting out there in the public space for people to not just be educated, but also embrace and be empowered by. And uh, that, that's been a really important one. I just learned this the other day and I was so excited that young people are gaining this resurgence and wanting to learn more about history and they're taking history into their own hands and crafting it into a way that it's, it's delivering a powerful message to the masses and that they can also have a voice in this. So th that's, that's what gives me hope. And I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about the work that Gloria Dickerson is doing, the work that these young people at the JPS Early College, Tougaloo Early College High School are doing. And I just look forward to seeing more across this state and also across the nation. Yes, I have the, I have the great privilege of watching my students uh, rediscover themselves through the art making process and to use the transformative power of art to make the, to make the invisible visible. And, and I see more and more of, stu of, our, of our students uh, use the transformative power of art to search for their own identity. And in such, they will continue to amplify what it is to be a human being in Tennessee and everywhere else. And so that, is, for me, is a grand monument. Thank you all so much. It's time for us to close. Um, so I just want to thank you all for this incredible conversation. It's truly been an honor to moderate this panel. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience who, who joined us here in person today. And thanks to everybody who joined us online as well. You will be able to find a summary of our discussion at zocalopublicsquare.org by tomorrow, plus interviews with all of our panelists. Um, you can also subscribe to Zocalo's newsletter, uh, the podcast, and social media accounts. This conversation has been, is part of Zocalo's series, How Should Societies Remember Their Sins, supported by the, Mello, the Mellon Foundation. I hope that you'll all join us when we have the next installation of this conversation, which is titled, Why Is It Remembering Enough to Repair? Um, Daphne, Rat, uh, Richard, and Patrick, thank you all so much. Everyone, please join me in once again thanking our panelists. <laughs>